Okay, members, um, we will now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call Trevor Clark to ask the first question. Mr. Clark. Uh, question number one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, if, with your um, permission, um, I would like to answer um, both questions one and four together. The Crown Court deals with some of the most serious and sensitive cases in the justice system, and therefore it is vitally important that justice is dealt with in a timely way. Speeding up justice is one of the biggest challenges facing the justice system and is a priority for the Department, Criminal Justice Partners and the Criminal Justice Board. The Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service has carried out extensive modifications to eight courtrooms at venues across Northern Ireland to facilitate COVID-secure jury trials from August 2020. In order to increase capacity for Crown Court trials, two further courtrooms in Lagonside are being modified. The first becomes operational this week, with the second expected to be operational in early March. Three further jury courtrooms will become operational in Antrim, Dungannon and Newry early in April. Following these works, there will be a total of 13 jury trial courtrooms available, which exceeds the average number of trials held at any one time pre-COVID. Courtrooms have been reconfigured with glass and perspex screens erected to allow proceedings to take place safely. Hand sanitation stations and social distancing signage have also been erected throughout the NICTS estate to guide users. Each venue have their own housekeepers who ensure that the courtrooms and jury deliberation rooms are cleaned at regular intervals throughout the day. Those called for jury service are provided with guidance in line with that provided by PHA not to attend should they have COVID-19 symptoms or if they have been advised to self-isolate. My department has also secured the use of additional external venues, sometimes referred to as Nightingale Courts, to increase capacity further. For example, the International Conference Centre, previously at the water, known as the Waterfront Hall, has been deployed for jury assembly and other court business, freeing up capacity in Lagonside Courts. Trevor Clark, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her uh, long and very full answer? And I think that uh, it has to be welcomed. But given that it's almost a year now since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, and whilst no one in this chamber can be blamed for that, there is obviously a direct knock on to both the solicitors themselves, the barristers, and indeed in many cases those who are actually standing trial in terms of the impact it may have on those. But what, in terms of the, the, particularly the, the solicitors' practices and the barristers, what financial support has been given to those individuals, given that their businesses have suffered because of the pandemic for the last 12 months? Well, in respect um, particularly of solicitors and barristers, um, people were allowed to claim for work uh, with respect to um, work that couldn't continue through the courts, but their ongoing work on cases, and they were able to do so earlier. We also had an interim scheme in place um, for solicitors and others to apply to, in addition to the normal hardship arrangements that are already in place with respect um, to the LSA and bringing forward payments. Um, however, the uptake on that was incredibly low, um, which I think is as a result of the fact that the measures already in place um, through the normal LSA arrangements seem to prove adequate for most cases. However, there will of course be some who, who do struggle, and that's without, without doubt. It was important for us in the department to ensure that there was a, a good flow of resources um, on cases that had already started um, to, um, those, to those legal practitioners, because it is vital for the operation of the justice system and um, that we return to having a full complement of practitioners after COVID and so it is important during that period where the courts weren't sitting that people were able to access that additional flexibility um, and also that additional support even though uptake was incredibly low. As the courts are sitting more normally now and business is being conducted remotely and in other ways um, it should now have resolved in terms of payments to le the legal profession and that they should be able to undertake the majority of the work that they would normally be undertaking and in some cases they have they have noted a sharp uptick um, in some cases, in some kinds of work, um, in solicitors' offices in particular. For example, with regard to people moving house, who perhaps um, had saved up additional money during the COVID crisis um, and have decided to make that move. Call Tom Buchanan, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for her response thus far and for work that is ongoing. But with months of delay that's run, that has been running into years. Uh, this is obviously having an adverse effect on the mental health of the victims and uh, the length of the process. Some of them are actually uh, pulling out of the process to try and regain a normal life again, which is really an indictment on the department. What encouragement, therefore, can you give to victims 
who feel that this whole process is letting them down? Well, with respect to the member's question, there is very little evidence of attrition, such as he suggests. And if he's aware of levels of attrition, it would be helpful if he would bring those to the department's um, attention. I don't think it is with respect an indictment of the department. In fact, I would say to the contrary. And what I've set out today is actually to the credit of the department, given the work that has been done to ensure that we've been able to restore and sustain. Um, court cases, particularly those more sensitive cases, um, to be able to proceed. Just to put it in context, prior to the COVID-19 lockdown, there were around 8,000 criminal cases in the court system. However, with the closure of some courts during the first lockdown last uh, spring, that rose to about 12,800 cases by September, a rise of 59%. With the reopening of more courts since August, there have been more cases disposed by the courts than received, and consequently the caseload has reduced. The most recent real-time management information indicates that the figure now stands at around 10,500 cases, which I think is a significant achievement, um, given that we have been battling um, against the effects of COVID. Also, it has to be borne in mind that since March 2020, monthly recorded crime has been lower than recorded for each corresponding month of the previous year. And so we continue to work with criminal justice partners in order to ensure that we can reduce that. But of course, the member will be fully aware that when it comes to the scheduling of cases, it is not a matter for the Department um, of Justice. It is a matter for the independent judiciary. And if he has particular concerns that those are not being scheduled in a way that is appropriate or in a way that is causing distress to victims, he should, of course, raise that with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice rather than with the Department for Justice. I would also um, say that when it comes to support for victims, we are aware that any delay in the court system does cause distress to victims. And that's why victim support have been particularly active and indeed did a presentation at the recent, at the recent Criminal Justice Board um, to discuss how we can ensure that despite COVID, we continue to, be, to offer the best possible support we can um, to those who are passing through the justice system on this occasion. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for her uh, responses thus far. Uh, given there, are, there have been historically delays uh, in the, the judicial system, and indeed the, the Minister may be aware that the Bar Library said that disclosure in relation to legacy cases is one of the main delays. Can the Minister give an, an update on what she intends to do to reduce those delays of those cases going to court? Well, I think that there are a number of elements to what the member has said. I mean, first of all, in terms of delay in the justice system, she will be aware that I have already brought um, the committal reform bill um, to the Assembly, and that should uh, remove part of the process in terms of committal and allow for direct committal for a significant number of offences, which will clear up um, a lot of time in terms of the, the speed of turnaround in the court system. Prior to COVID, we had already seen a distinct improvement in terms of the, the performance of the justice system in terms of court times, um, and so that was a significant improvement. So we started off from a better place than we may have been in before. With respect to legacy cases, of course, the issue of disclosure is one that in the main will fall to organisations outside my particular role in remit. I am aware, for example, that there are issues around digitisation of police records and other things, and that is a project that the Chief Constable is taking forward uh, with the Policing Board in terms of prioritising resource to ensure that those records are held in a format that allows them to be easy to access and also easy then to be able to disclose for further investigation. But it is important, and I reiterate this, that all investigation is conducted in a way that is timely um, and that does not add unnecessarily to the stress that victims are under, or indeed to the shadow that hangs over those who are the accused in such cases. I call Gemma Dolan. Garmelga, can call you question number two. In recent days and weeks, we have seen how the actions of a small number of people have exposed a discontent in some communities that is manifesting into intimidation and hate. There should be no room for perception that expressions of hate or hate crime in any form, including instilling hatred or fear through the use of words, behaviours and displays of certain materials, is acceptable. The Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill does not contain any provisions arising from the independent review of the hate crime legislation. Given the breadth and scale of the recommendations in the hate crime review that relate to proposed legislative solutions, it is not possible to bring any of them forward for inclusion in the Justice Bill in the time available before drafting of the Bill is finalised and the Bill is introduced into the Assembly. This is currently planned for April 2021. 
The Department's legislative programme is kept under constant review and it is my intention that a standalone bill to deliver the legislative requirements arising from the review should be developed for introduction into the Assembly in the next mandate. Members will note that in his report, Judge Marinan has recommended that all hate crime and hate speech law should be consolidated into a new hate crime and public order Northern Ireland bill, excluding, of course, any issues pertaining to law on reserve matters. My officials have commenced work to consider all the recommendations in the Hate Crime Legislation Review Report with a view to informing a departmental response in due course. This work will also include consideration on any recommendations that can be progressed in the short term where legislation may not be required. Chairman Dolan, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, can the Minister indicate whether she anticipates that all of the recommendations will be included in the Bill for the next mandate? At this stage, it would be uh, inappropriate for me to give a public response to that because I haven't yet given my formal response and gone through the normal processes. But as I said at the time when the report was presented to me, um, there is very little one could argue with in terms of the recommendations that have been brought forward by Judge Marinan. There are some questions about overlap with other work that is ongoing within the executive. For example, when he talks about the responsibilities on departments to deal um, with the outworkings and the, visual, the visible representations of sectarian hate crime in our society, there is a piece of work, as you will be aware, um, in terms of the FIC Commission report, which currently sits with the executive office. I would like to see that published and I would like a discussion at the executive in order that we are in a position to decide how and when that particular piece of work will be taken forward because that will obviously inform progress with relation to sectarianism as part of the overall hate crime programme. But as I say, there was very little in that report that I think one would disagree with. Call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, given the recent uh, disgraceful comments from the MP from East Derry, does the Minister have any concern that one of the parties in the executive he has a public representative with such reprehensible, poisonous and dangerous views. Is she concerned that if they don't take swift action against this MP, that will send a terrible message to all those victims of hate crime? Well, I'm aware of the particular comments to which the member refers. I think they were not only um, reprehensible and racist, but I think that they were also quite bizarre. Anyone who has any understanding of the history of gospel music will be aware that it comes from the trials and tribulations of those um, who were often sent to the US as slaves. And therefore, it is a tradition of singing, a tradition of music that has grown up from that background. And to suggest that there was anything at all to do with BLM or any other kind of positive discrimination in the fact that the best singers were through to the competition and those most experienced were judging it, I think, is a, is a mistake. And I think the member is correct that the test will really be how parties individually deal with those issues within their own ranks because I'm afraid as political leadership we have a job of work to do in terms of showing leadership within our own organisations, within our own ranks in terms of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable and of course people have the right to freedom of speech but it doesn't come free of responsibility and indeed consequences. Paul, Paul Given. Speaker, and the Minister has touched on, on this point uh, at the closing of her remarks there in respect of freedom of speech. There, there is much in this report that uh, I'll be able to support, um, but the Minister will be aware of some concern, particularly from a Christian faith perspective, that the recommendation to repeal defences for freedom of expression in the Public Order Act of 1986 is of significant concern, given that 97 per cent of individuals say that that should be retained. And in light of comments from Ivan Hare, QC, a human rights specialist that there is an absence of key freedom of expression provisions akin to those in England and Wales is something that has caused alarm. So will the Minister recognise it is important uh, that there is freedom of expression, and, but absolutely uh, that that needs to be regulated in a way that doesn't incite hatred or acts of crime? I agree with the member that there, is, there has to be space in any um, civilised um, society and indeed in any democratic society for freedom of expression and for people to be allowed to express their views. And that will often, as the law already states, amount to those views which are offensive to some um, and undesirable to others. And we have to recognise that that is part of living in a community where not everyone will agree. However, I do think it's important that when it comes to developing the law in this space, that we look very carefully at the balance of human rights. And that's one of the reasons reasons why I think it is best that we take the hate crime legislation forward as a package so that we can look at the balances and the checks that are in there to ensure personal freedoms, to ensure that people's Article um, 9 rights of religious freedom under the ACHR are not in any way compromised by our desire to ensure that there is, um, that there is protection. 
um, for those um, from minority groups who may find themselves subject to hate speech. I have to say that as someone who shares Paul's faith, um, I also understand that those of us of a Christian faith have a particular duty um, beyond that which the law imposes on us to use our rhetoric and our language very carefully and sensitively in terms of the respect for the person and the dignity of every individual and every human created in God's image. And I hope that he would recognise that the vast majority of Christians wouldn't find themselves in contravention um, of hate crime speech um, simply for holding forth their faith um, in a temperate and a measured way. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the Minister for her answers so far. Um, does the Minister agree that while her department develops proposals to strengthen our legislation around hate crime, as was recommended, as she has said, by Judge Maranan, that there is much that can be done across government on hate more generally? For example, ensuring diversity and inclusion and by delivering on the racial equality strategy? Well, I think the member is absolutely right. Of course, there is a considerable amount of work that can be done within the DOJ, but indeed beyond it and across the executive, in terms of how we can actually tackle hate crime um, and do more work around diversity. And I'll take the opportunity to highlight some of that work being undertaken, particularly in the criminal justice system, to address attitudes that contribute to hate. My department is developing a diversity calendar, which will feed into the wider Northern Ireland Civil Service Diversity Plan. And that will support the commitment of the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service to make a positive impact by promoting diversity and inclusion in our workplaces. The prison service promotes equality issues among staff and prisoners and holds awareness events on LGBT, cultural and disability issues on a routine basis. The Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service offer a generic form of training around witness and victim empathy and awareness. However, COVID-19 has had an impact on the format of this training, redirecting it from classroom-based face-to-face learning to an online e-learning course, which is still in development with the NSPCC and the Victim Service NI. We hope to have that rolled out um, very soon. The key role of the Department's Racial Equality Champion is to support delivery of the Racial Equality Strategy 2015 to 2025, and that has included close engagement with the Racial Equality Subgroup, coordinated by the Executive Office, and consists of represent, uh, representatives from the minority ethnic sector. As Racial Equality Champion, they have promoted awareness of the Racial Equality Strategy within the Department, emphasising the importance of racial equality and good race relations, as well as being the senior point of contact for issues relating to racial equality. In addition, my department, in partnership with the Northern Ireland Policing Board, provides funding to police and community safety partnerships to deliver community safety initiatives and support community confidence in policing in the 11 council areas. These have included a range of measures to address hate crime. It is essential that diversity is addressed across the criminal justice system and that the structures that we have are reflective of the totality of our community here in Northern Ireland. Question number three. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have met with the families of Charlotte Murray and Lisa Dorian, who are searching for ways to find Charlotte and Lisa's remains, and I have commissioned a focused review of the position to consider all the possible options. It will be a number of years before Charlotte Murray's killer can apply for release on licence to the, repo, to the, to the pro, parole commissioners, and there are no other prisoners in Northern Ireland who would be affected by a change in the law at present. However, I wish to give this important matter the consideration it deserves before deciding on the best way forward, and I have undertaken to do so in conjunction with both families, um, because I would want very much for them to be satisfied with the outcome. Thanks very much, Minister, for that and for mentioning those specific cases. Um, does the Minister, uh, may she able to confirm with that limited stakeholder review that has been mentioned previously in the, the Assembly, that I presume has been carried out, and I'm just wondering what are the subsequent steps to that? Well, I think the first and most important thing is that we should not rush into making legislation on any issue. What is legislated for in England and Wales, for example, is not always an appropriate fit for our own circumstances here. I have been very struck by the dignity of the families and appreciation of their, their appreciation of the complexity of the problem that we face. Work to carry out a process of engagement with the families and other key stakeholders, so not only the families, to determine the most effective way to address this is underway. That includes people, for example, like the parole commissioners themselves, in order that we can take their views on how any piece of law might operate in that space. I hope to report on my conclusions on a way forward in the spring of this year. As evidenced by the passing of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill and the introduction of the Stalking Bill and my reviews of the law on non-fatal strangulation, 
and the issue of consent, uh, of consent not being a defence to serious harm. I am committed to delivering a significant programme of work under the Domestic and Sexual Violence Abuse Strategy, working with statutory and voluntary sector partners, and I would hope that this would form part of that overall work. Well, Liz Kimmins. Can call and I thank the Minister for answer so far. I understand that the issue of non-disclosure of information about the victim is one that must already be considered by parole commissioners when assessing a prisoner's suitability for release on licence. But could the Minister clarify how much weight is carried in these assessments in comparison to other considerations such as good behaviour? With respect to the consideration of parole commissioners, um, obviously they are completely independent, as you will appreciate, of the Department of Justice, and the weighting that they will give these matters in any case is a matter entirely for them. However, it would be fair to say that there are a number of considerations when it comes to the law in this regard. Firstly, the first time that a person applies for parole in such a case is a long time after the original murder. And that means that victims have to live for a very long time before they actually would be able to see this legislation used. So there are a number of points throughout the justice system, whether that is at the point um, of conviction um, or sentencing, where I believe it may be more appropriate to try to find the correct levers and um, to try to extract information on where victims' remains are held um, in advance, because I think that that would bring a quicker resolution for many victims. Where that is not successful and where we are unable to do so, then I believe that the parole commissioners do have a role to play in this, but they will obviously, their, their priority is to assess someone with, with respect to whether that person poses a significant harm to society and whether that harm can be safely managed in society. And so you can appreciate that the issue of disclosure of remains, whilst it will inform their decision, um, may not be the main influencing factor in whether someone is released um, from, uh, per, fr from prison or not. Um, it will be a degree of assessment of harm and risk. Well, Cara Hunter. Speaker, uh, number five, please. Like many, I welcome the recent establishment of the Rape Crisis Centre by our voluntary sector partners. Services available to women and men who have been affected by rape or serious sexual assault in adulthood. The services provided are complementary to a range of services provided by my own department in conjunction with our statutory and voluntary sector partners for those who have been affected by sexual violence and abuse. This includes a 24-hour domestic and sexual abuse helpline, sexual violence counselling services funded by the Department of Health and provided by Nexus NI, and independent sexual violence advocates. I also welcome the vital work taken forward by the Rowan Sexual Assault Referral Centre, which offers a range of important physical and emotional support services for children, young people, women and men. The services are available to anyone sexually assaulted or raped, whether in the past or more recently. The Rowan Service is equally funded by the Department of Health and the PSNI and supported nearly 900 service users in the last financial year. In addition, work is underway on a multi-agency basis to implement the Gillen Review. This involves a significant body of work that will transform the law and procedures in relation to serious sexual offences and will deliver significant improvements for victims. This includes the new remote evidence centres in Belfast and Craigalvin, which will soon allow vulnerable child um, victims and other witnesses to provide evidence more remote um, from court buildings. In addition, by the 1st of April this year, adult complainants in serious sexual offence cases will be able to avail of legal expert advice from sexual offences legal advisers, ensuring that they understand their rights and can make informed decisions. Further changes are in train and we have been working with partners across justice with key priorities including measures to address delay, work to develop a comprehensive wraparound approach to victims who are children and ensuring that logistically our courts provide appropriate facilities which respect the unique challenges posed in these cases and ensure a supportive environment. Cara Hunter, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for her uh, detailed answer. In 2020, there were over uh, 3,000 sexual offences reported here uh, to the PSNI. Uh, 960 of them were incidents of rape uh, here in the north, so it's welcome news the steps that are being taken to support both victims and survivors. Um, uh, my question for the Minister is, uh, can she outline any conversations that she has had either with the PSNI um, or the Education Minister on providing sexual consent education to contribute to the prevention of uh, of further sexual assaults here in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Well, I thank the member for her question, and this is something I think I touched on very briefly um, this morning, but I'm glad to be able um, to set it out in a bit more detail. Um, obviously, in terms of the Gillen Review, there was a particular issue raised um, around the need for better education around consent relationships 
um, and sexual education in general. And we have been having ongoing work at official level in terms of trying to take that forward. Indeed, we are working at the moment, and I've written to the Education Minister to look at, at, at the potential of us meeting um, to discuss further progress that may be made in that regard. I believe that it is important because that, to me, is going to be crucial when it comes to prevention um, of sexual assault. I think we need to tackle some of the toxic ideas that people have around sexual relationships. We need to give people confidence around consent and what that looks like. And I think it's really important that we do that in a consistent and holistic way and in a non-judgmental way um, right across the school sector um, because I think without that it leaves young people um, in a very vulnerable position with respect to their own understanding of the law. I call Linda Dillon. No, good, Ken Cornia, and thank the Minister. I want to thank the member for, for bringing this question to the House today. And Minister, I mean, you've just touched upon it in relation to the, the education piece and obviously as I, as I outlined this morning my concern is that Schools get to decide really what, what type of education they give around healthy relationships, and I don't think that that's a very good way of delivering it. Is there any thinking outside the box about how we can do this in relation to ensuring that there's a uniformed way for all young people to get educated around what a healthy relationship looks like? For example, there was a really good campaign called the Pants Campaign, which was to explain to very young children about how to protect themselves, which was excellent. And I certainly spoke to my child about it, and she was only three, but she understood what I was talking about. So it's really important that we're able to get this information out there to our young people and our teenagers. Well, I think the member is absolutely right, and I've seen the campaign um, myself, and I think it's a very useful thing to be able to explain in simple language to children, in language that they understand, uh, what it is to have bodily autonomy, what it is to have privacy, what is inappropriate touching and what is not. Not to make children fearful of the world around them, but to make them equipped because unfortunately not everyone is to be trusted and children need to be aware of that, sadly, from a very young age. Um, and I think doing that in an age-appropriate way and in a sensitive way is hugely important in terms of giving young children confidence. But I think that there is an issue in terms of um, how we take this forward, and I certainly want to work in support of the Minister for Education. I think it's important that we have a consistent approach, that we look at the, at the curriculum around RSE, that we look at how that impacts on issues like domestic violence, on issues like stalking, on issues like abusive and coercive relationships, but also on key issues around sexual abuse and sexual violence um, and bodily autonomy and indeed um, people's uh, right um, to say no um, to sexual contact. I think it's also important that that is non-judgmental that that non education. There are many young people um, in our education system of different sexualities, um, of different genders, and we need to be sure that those young people are all equipped um, for adult life and able to form healthy um, and stable and safe relationships. I call George Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I ask the Minister if a centre could be located in the northwest of the province? Well, at this stage, um, this, the, there is no plans uh, in terms of the department locating a centre in any particular location. But most of these issues, which are so sensitive and difficult, require very specialist support. And therefore, it is important um, that people are able to access that support, but also that it is a specialist centre. And therefore, it is provided on a geographical, um, on an all of Northern Ireland geographical basis. I do think also that it's important um, to look at what we're doing around, for example, the rollout of remote evidence centres in order to help vulnerable victims and witnesses, I think that that's an important piece of work, and that is a piece of work that we intend over time to extend to all of our courthouses where jury trials are held. Sorry, when that ends the period for list listed questions, we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister outline her plans in light of the announcement by the Irish Government? that people from Northern Ireland will be fined for crossing the border for non-essential travel, and if she intends to implement a similar measure here? Well, I thank the member um, for his question. He will appreciate that it is not appropriate for me as Justice Minister to comment on the enforcement actions in relation to COVID-19 restrictions of the Angarda Shikana in another jurisdiction. There is no applicable restriction in the current health protection regulations that would enable or require the PSNI to perform similar checks. 
The health protection regulations are the responsibility of the Department of Health. Any amendments to the regulations are a matter for the executive based on recommendations brought forward by the Health Minister, informed by the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer. It is currently, as you know, not an offence here um, to cross county boundaries, whereas in the Republic of Ireland it already is an offence to cross county boundaries. And I think, to be clear, that that is the offence that is being enforced um, in the south rather than an enforcement on crossing the border. It is actually the county boundaries, though obviously those are contiguous in many cases. Harry Harvey, supplementary. Okay. And I thank the uh, Minister for our answers so far. The Irish government are now issuing 500 euro fines for those travelling to airports and ports for non-essential purposes. This is evidently to curb international travel and keep Irish citizens safe. Will the Minister commit to a similar scheme here? Well, the member will be aware um, that I was at the ad hoc committee um, a number of weeks ago after having um, reviewed by request of the executive the penalties and offences uh, which we apply in Northern Ireland around COVID-19. And it was agreed that we would not put um, any offence in regulations with respect to travel, but instead would place it in guidance that people should not travel more than 10 miles from their home for exercise. Out with that, there are no restrictions on the distance that people can travel. The focus has been on trying to ensure that people stay as close to home as possible by choice, but also that they only leave their home when it is essential for them to do so. Question five has been withdrawn, and I call Linda Dillon. Gormayo, good can call you. Can the minister confirm if you have had any conversations with the police ombudsman's office in relation to the outstanding um, investigation or outstanding report rather into the murders at Sean Graham's boogies? The families and victims have been told now on four separate occasions that they will be getting that report and they're still awaiting it. Well, obviously, I have a number of conversations with the police ombudsman with respect to legacy cases. Um, however, it is for the police ombudsman, obviously, who is completely independent of my office, and I realise that members get very frustrated when I tell them these, uh, this on a regular basis, but it would be a matter for her, obviously, to manage that case um, and to manage any disclosure um, of the report to the victims and not for me to prejudge. Um, however, I'm sure that she will, as everyone else does, have watched Question Time today and have heard the members' concerns about it and will no doubt uh, want to act on that. Linda Dillon, supplementary. I thank the Minister for that and, and I absolutely accept that the Ombudsman's Office should be independent. It's just, it is a concern my family have been told on four separate occasions that, that they will be getting a report and still haven't received it. Can the Minister confirm then, in light of that, that if you had any commitment or even any indication from the British Government, the NAO, the Secretary of State, that they intend to implement the HIU and all of the legacy mechanisms agreed at the Stormont House Agreement by the five parties, the two governments, and that were consulted upon with victims and wider society. And 17,500 responses went into that consultation, which I think anybody would agree is quite a statement in itself. Well, the member knows my position and, and that of my party when it comes to this particular issue, and she is also aware from previous um, statements which I've made here in the chamber um, that I have raised this on many occasions. Uh, with the Secretary of State uh, and with the UK Government more generally. Unfortunately, in direct answer to her question as to whether I've had any reassurances, the answer is no. And I call Colin McGrath. Speaker, uh, would the Minister agree that antisocial behaviour can cause a significant and persistent problem in communities and is best addressed with a cross-sectoral approach with community safety at the heart of it? Yes, I completely agree with the member, and I think some of the work that the PCSPs, for example, do uh, with, uh, with effective work on the ground, bringing in housing executive, um, the infrastructure, um, and other uh, bodies that are responsible for delivery of services in those areas, can also be of great assistance in terms of bringing people together with the police um, and with councils and others to be able to find resolution. I think it is important that people, particularly at the moment, um, are able to live free of antisocial behaviour. We have seen a marked increase in the amount of antisocial behaviour reported to police, and some of that will be a factor of people being at home much more than might have been the case um, at other times, and so much more aware um, of, of, of behaviour that is happening in their own neighbourhood um, that is disruptive and difficult to live with, and it is important that people are able to live in peace. Supplementary, Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would um, the Minister commit to an urgent review of antisocial behaviour in Downpatrick, where we have seen arson, assaults and interruption to businesses, and all during a COVID period? And would the Minister be prepared to commit extra funds to the community safety work in the area um, if it was needed? 
With respect to reviewing in a particular neighbourhood, obviously that is something that initially we would want the council and the police um, to come to the department um, about. And if they feel that resources are in some way um, restricting their ability to respond to that, we would want to hear that um, and listen very carefully to that case. But the member will be aware, um, as are all members, having seen the draft budget, that there is very little wiggle room um, in respect of what we might be able to do. But it is certainly something that the community safety partnership in the area ought to be aware of and hopefully will be able to prioritise as they they look at rolling out their funds and indeed their programmes over the next number of years. Nicole Jim Allister. Um, well, as the Minister has no role in the appointments of our judges, uh, has she any concern that in the upper tier of our judiciary there is not a single Lord Justice with a Protestant community background? Is that something which she thinks is healthy? in this era when cross-community confidence is so important? Well, Mr Speaker, the member has raised this issue um, with me in the past, um, and I believe that um, equitable, equitable uh, provision um, across our community is absolutely important, and that inclusion should be at the heart of all of the services we provide in the Department of Justice. However, we know that in order to become a higher-tier judge, one needs considerable experience, and it is a merit-based appointment system that applies. And therefore, I would be very cautious of wanting to read anything into a very small number of appointments that could fluctuate from being entirely Protestant, entirely Catholic, or indeed anything else. I would also be very uncomfortable, frankly, with judging what people's perceived religious background might be. Um, without them actually having assented to that, um, because of course there are many of us um, who don't appreciate being uh, placed in boxes or pigeonholed when it comes to assessing um, our religious um, or community background, and the judges may well fall into that category. Tim Wallace, or supplementary. Oh, I do wonder if the um, minister would be so sanguine about it if we were in a situation where there wasn't a single Catholic within the Lord Justices. Uh, has she discussed this issue with the Lord Chief Justice and conveyed the fact that cross-community confidence for the judiciary is very important? I think the Lord Chief Justice, Mr Speaker, is well aware that confidence in the judiciary, um, not just cross-community confidence, but for everyone in our community is important. And I don't think I need to teach the Lord Chief Justice how to suck eggs. Um, when it comes to the issue of whether I would be so sanguine were it to be the case that all of the higher tier judges um, were, were Protestant, I would be every bit as sanguine because, of course, I recognise and respect the fact that ju the judiciary um, do a professional job, an impartial job, and one that is not influenced by their community background. And it is, frankly, I think, a very dangerous road to go down, as the member seems to be, particularly for someone in the legal profession, to suggest that they are any less capable because of their religious background. Round, to be entirely to be entirely impartial and to command full cross community support. They call Paul Fruit. Given that the police falls under the Justice Minister's remit, and given the fact that we have passed draconian legislation which the police now have to enforce, and given the fact that many organisers of annual memorial services have cancelled this year. Is it time that the Justice Minister came out and made a statement advising groups in the coming weeks and maybe months when we are in lockdown measures that they should not hold uh, annual mem uh, memorial services? Well, Mr Speaker, I never fail to be shocked that members of the Justice Committee and indeed a former chair can misunderstand my role so fundamentally. I am not the Minister for Policing. Let me be clear about that. I am the Minister of Justice. And the issues around policing are dealt with um, by the policing board, where oversight is given, by the chief constable, who is responsible um, for operational decisions, um, and by the ombudsman's office, who will investigate any complaints against police officers. My role in terms of policing is simply to provide adequate legislation um, and to provide funding for the, policing for the police. It is not my role to interfere uh, with their decisions. However, when it comes to the issue that the member raises about whether or not people should be gathering, I cannot be clearer than having brought through this House um, the, the regulations on behalf of the Health Minister that dealt with these issues. And I would advise anyone, for any reason, to avoid gathering in public at this time, not because it is a burden to the police, but because it is a risk to their health and well-being. 
Oh, I certainly agree with the Minister that the regulations are, are, and the law is inadequate uh, with regards to uh, th this period of time. The Minister talks about uh, advice and about what should happen and, and not happen with regards to the COVID regulations, but she is part of the executive that forms the legislation. She shares that executive with other parties, and it seems to be the case that other parties, in particular Sinn Féin, was involved in some shape or form with the memorial service on the Armour Road. Can the Minister enlighten this House as to her advice with regards to political parties in the executive, which she sits on around gathering and organising these events or attending these events during lockdown? Mr Speaker, um, first of all, I didn't say that the current law was inadequate. I said it was adequate um, in terms of the provisions um, around what people um, ought to be able to do. It's clear that while the member is skirting around the issue, uh, what he wants is for me to comment on the events that took place on Friday afternoon. So I will do so, Mr Speaker. I want first of all to acknowledge that I understand recent events have caused serious distress to victims and survivors as well as to the community more widely. It is vital, despite the events of last week, that collectively we reaffirm our shared commitment to delivering the aim of safer communities, including regarding COVID, where we all respect the law and each other. I am committed to working with the Chief Constable, the Policing Board, political parties, victims and survivors, their representatives and the wider public in trying to rebuild some of the trust and make good some of the damage that has been caused um, over recent days and weeks. This is the space that all politicians and political leaders should be in at this time. And I'm sure the member will agree that the policing board has a crucial role to play in enhancing that community confidence in policing and respect for adherence to the law. I work with my colleagues in the executive to ensure that there is adequate legislation and regulations in place um, that give guidance to people and give, give structure to the COVID regulations. These are unusual times, Mr Speaker, and the context that we live through is difficult and it is challenging, no more so than when we deal with bereaved victims, when we deal with families who are grieving. And I think that instead of trying to use this as a political battering ram against one's opponents, it would be wise to think for a moment of the families themselves and their grief. It would be wise to think of the difficult job that the police themselves have to do in such complex circumstances and to be more measured in the approach that we take when it comes to discussing these measures. I call Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers uh, so far. Uh, Minister, can I ask you, in reply to Mr. Frew, you used the words uh, safer communities and indeed that we were living in diffi difficult and challenging uh, days. The Minister will be aware of the um, community tensions, um, degree of antisocial behaviour that has arisen, and perhaps in our own the constituency that we both uh, represent at the moment. Can I ask the Minister if she is intent on supporting in any additional manner those who are working at the very sharp end uh, of this to uh, try to quell the, the situation? Mr Speaker, first of all, I want to say that what happened in our own constituency, um, and it's only one instance um, that the member alludes to, but it was a very visual uh, and very high profile incident last week, is absolutely reprehensible. And I said at the time it was absolutely disgraceful. Intimidation of anyone in our community by anyone in our community is not acceptable. There is no excuse. And those who are fueling those tensions, who are behind um, those acts um, of intimidation, frankly, ought to be taken off the streets. And I hope that they will be. I hope that they will be. With respect to those who are trying to quell the tensions and trying to bring that um, good order to that, I have already met with the Chief Constable. Um, I have discussed um, with him at length um, the particular issues that people face in that constituency that are relayed to me as a constituency MLA day on day. 
How he responds to that in terms of the policing challenge, again, is an operational matter for the Chief Constable. But he certainly is aware of the issues, aware of the tensions. And if people are struggling um, around the interface, I know that my own officials have already been in touch uh, with people in and around that particular area, both in terms of trying to understand better the issues that are ongoing, but also in terms of trying to provide the kind of support that we talk about in the Tackling Paramilitarism programme, about building more resilient communities that can resist the influence and coercion of paramilitary organisations. Robin Newton, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her, for her answer. I, I was really thinking, Minister, rather than just contacting the police and working via the, the police, that indeed those who are working, if I use the expression, at the coalface in trying to address this uh, situation really do need additional support on top of what they are normally receive. Well, Mr Speaker, we have received no requests for such support, but I know um, that through the PCSPs and through my own department and the work that they do already in that neighbourhood, um, that there is a lot of support available to local people. Um, but if there is more that can be done, of course, I would want that it would be done. Um, and I'm more than happy to extend the offer of a meeting with the member um, if he feels that there are areas where the department um, may have some ability. But I would caution against suggesting, of course, as you would expect, that the police are not also working at the coalface in that community, um, because indeed they are and are very much in support of those um, who want uh, and who and who want to ensure um, who want to ensure that there is stability um, and indeed lawfulness in that community. One in which I grew up, and I have to say, one in which I was very distressed to see the events of last week. And time is up. And would members please take a raise for a moment or two?